Number five, the Lurlian Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10 story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10 story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra would regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, two more. Another two are growing, yeah. Good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, AKA huge monster. Also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the World Serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah, basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, Roid Rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Coming in at number three, we've got SCP-1682. Sunworms! Hell yeah, I feel like that's good enough of a description. I don't need to say anything else, just sunworms. Okay, I'll, I guess I should explain the whole thing. See, these are large, segmented, worm-like entities that exist in the sun. The good folks over the foundation have estimated that the one that we've designated 1682 is over 28,000 kilometers long. It appears to dive and loop for long periods of time, often roaming the surface of the photosphere for three or four months before diving down and disappearing for four to eight months. The people investigating it believed it to be a permanent fixture at that point, but one day it up and fired its way across the galaxy. It emerged from the photosphere at a speed of 1,045.5 kilometers per second and was last sighted passing Pluto. Now, get this. Some folks are calling it a solar tapeworm. That's right, it lives in the bowels of the sun until it's sapped enough energy and then heads off on its merry way. It's an image I didn't need. Coming in at number two, we've got SCP-2859. This one literally mirrors an entire quadrant of the solar system, so if that's not big, I don't know what to tell you. Try not to feel too dwarfed in its shadow, you know, we're all tiny specks of insignificant nothing if you really think about it. So isn't that a little bit comforting? No, not to you? Okay, well, on with the explanation anyway. It will manifest in enclosed, unused space, eventually breaching the object encapsulating it. Expeditions inside have shown that celestial objects do indeed exist within it in the precise locations that they would be otherwise. It also tends to pull anything that makes contact with its threshold in. 
Otherwise, it doesn't really affect the area around it. It just kind of is there. It's weird and potentially micro radiation inducing, but not terrible in of itself. But there is a giant species of giant serpentine predators around 80,000 kilometers in length that do seem to follow this anomaly wherever it goes. And anything that it pulls in, they will consume. So that's not good. Instances of 2859 have been spotted dangerously close to Earth, too, so you better keep an eye out. And finally, at number one, we've got SCP-3200. Get this. We've made some claims about enormous stuff in this video, but this SCP is literally light years in diameter. 300 million light years, to be precise. That is a big, big anomaly. It's expanding by about 1 million light years per year, too. This void could potentially collapse the universe. That's how huge it is. If it were 2009, it would be a great source for run-ups to Yo Mama jokes. However, because we've moved past that as a society, I'll avoid stooping that low. Suffice it to say, this is one gigantic SCP. The exact properties of this thing are currently unknown too. It was discovered by civilian scientists, and the folks who investigated it most closely ran into some issues. The Peregrine Expedition took some experimental tech and ran with it, hoping to find something useful within the SCP-3200 void. Taking advantage of temporal sinks, the crew was able to travel into the heart of the anomaly in a relatively short period of time. They arrived in the void and saw nothing but blackness. No stars, no galaxies, true void action. Eventually, a box showed up, surprising the crew. Inside was a CD containing a video of the captain talking to camera. He claimed they'd been trying to slow the anomaly's growth to little success, which disturbed the crew. Over time, reality began to act different, and even more different than they expected going in. They also managed to amass quite the collection of footage of the captain speaking about the anomaly. None of these elaborated on what the anomaly was actually doing, though. Eventually, tragically, they got to the source of the matter. After witnessing thousands of different iterations of himself investigate the void over a period of what could be thousands of years, it became clear to the captain that space-time was torn and had been rending itself apart. The things they've seen are echoes of different timelines, produced, consumed, and repurposed by the abyss. There's no way to fix it, although each iteration of the crew does their best. It's growing larger, consuming more, and yet there is nothing we can do about it. In the last words of Captain Kuznetsov, we've seen into the abyss, and by God, it hates us. Coming in at number five, Cyclops. I mean, we can't have a giant creature list without including one of the most infamous giants in history, Cyclops. Hailing from Greek mythology and then later Roman mythology, the Cyclops were giant one-eyed creatures who can be distinguished in three groups. In Hesiod's Theogony, they're the brothers Brontes, Sterapus, and Argus, I think, <laughs> who provided Zeus with his weapon, the Thunderbolt. In Homer's Odyssey, they are an uncivilized group of shepherds, the brethren of Polyphemus encountered by Odysseus. Cyclopses were also famous as the builders of the Cyclopean walls of Mycenae and Tyrannus. For the sake of avoiding confusion, let's focus our attention to the Homeric Cyclopses. In an episode of Homer's Odyssey, the hero Odysseus encounters the Cyclops Polyphemus, the son of Poseidon, a one-eyed man-eating giant who lives with his fellow Cyclopses in a distant land. They live in the world of men rather than among the gods. Homeric Cyclopses are presented as uncivilized shepherds, savages, and have no regard for Zeus. They live solitary lives and have no government. They are said to be inhospitable to strangers, slaughtering and eating all who come to their land. Coming in at number 4, Corb or the Fomorians. The Fomorians are a supernatural race in Irish mythology, often betrayed as hostile and monstrous beings who come from under the sea or the earth. However, later they were portrayed as giants and sea raiders and enemies of islands first settlers. They appear to have once been gods who represent the harmful or destructive powers of nature, personifications of chaos, darkness, death, blight, and drought. In Old and Middle Irish, the race is typically called the Fomor or Fomori, with an individual member being called a Fomor. They are often regarded as malevolent spirits dwelling underwater and in the nether regions of the earth, before later being portrayed as the aforementioned sea raiders. This was heavily influenced by the Viking raids on Island that were taking place during this time. Oftentimes they were depicted as having the body of a man and the head of a goat, and according to an 11th century book, they are said to have one eye, one arm, and one leg. Coming in at number three, we've got Kroll. Alright, we're three for three here, not exactly hitting the horror nail on the head, 
but giant monsters are scary all on their own. Whether or not they're featured in true horror movies doesn't matter. Now that I've done my mental gymnastics, let's talk about this gargantuan Doctor Who beast. Ages ago, giant squid were brought to Delta 3, a moon orbiting Delta Magna. Usually it's a bad idea to introduce brand new species to an unprepared ecosystem, and this proves to be true once again when Kroll eats a swampy priest along with a holy relic. After this unfortunate meal, Kroll begins to mutate in unexpected ways. The biggest change of all was definitely his size. Kroll was suddenly a mile wide and hundreds of meters tall. He promptly became the god of Delta III, living under the mud, munching on whatever he get his tentacles around. The swampies that inhabited the moon began to worship Kroll and saw him as a religious deity. Now they even call the times he surfaces manifestations. I mean, it makes sense. If you were a primitive species of green people living on a moon and a mile wide squid kept showing up, you'd probably think it was a higher power too. A mile wide. They also rely on the beast to kill their enemies, which he is very capable of doing. Well, until the good doctor rolls up. But hey, not even the biggest of big monsters can stand up to a Time Lord. Coming in at number two, we've got King Ghidra. Oh. Baby. See, I could have populated this entire list with entries from the Godzilla verse, but then it would just become a Godzilla list. I guess Godzilla Earth could have made the cut too. Which would be fun, but it's just not on the agenda today. So I went through all of the iconic beasts and monsters that have at some point fought or teamed up or existed at the same time as Godzilla and tried to find the biggest one. Godzilla itself was up for consideration, but if you've ever seen these two square off, you'll know who the larger lad is. Sporting three heads and a wingspan that can block out the sun, King Ghidra is a massive monster. It makes plenty of appearances across all sorts of movies, but we'll focus on his appearance in Godzilla vs. King Ghidra, which, you know, come on. Well, this Hydra-like being stands at 150 meters tall and has a wingspan of 175. If you want big, you've got it. And those wings better be big too, as he weighs over 70,000 tons. It's a miracle it can get off the ground at all. But once it's up there, reach Mach 3. Many Godzilla monsters end up teaming up with the titular icon from time to time, but never King Ghidra. The two are diametrically opposed, arch rivals, never to see eye to eye on anything, and I can respect that long-standing beef. Between these two, it's on sight. He's a force of pure evil, meant to destroy anything and everything it can. There's no good lurking within, no greater purpose beyond destruction, and he's really good at destruction. Ghidra can fire gravity beams and destroy city blocks in an instant. He can generate light with his wings. He can suck the life force out of anyone foolish to get close. So size isn't the only terrifying thing about this monster. He's got an RPG protagonist's toolbox worth of powers too. And coming in at number one, we've got Clover. The main monster from Cloverfield. Clover is pretty big, right? Can rampage through New York, toss the Statue of Liberty, and generally cause a lot of trouble. But get this, the towering entity that peers down at the camera in the film's penultimate scene isn't even fully grown. It's just a baby. No wonder it was so cranky. But for real, Clover can get way, way bigger. In the Cloverfield Paradox, we get an up-close look at the full-grown abomination. As an escape capsule heads back to Earth, a welcome party is organized. And by welcome party, I mean giant monster. And by organized, I mean he sticks his head through the clouds. They're cumulus clouds too, so the monster is poking his head through cloud cover at around a thousand meters above ground level. And the pod is landing over water, meaning that the monster is likely partially submerged too. The average depth of the ocean is a few kilometers deep, and we can't prove that the monster is standing anywhere particularly deep, but I'll let you draw your own conclusions there. We know that the baby is around 100 meters tall, and we know that the adult is poking its head through the clouds above the ocean, so you tell me how tall you think it really is. It definitely dwarfs anything else we've discussed so far. Sheesh. Kicking off at number five, Destroy All Monsters, 1968. Alright, probably the best place to start if you're not sure what kaiju cinema is, is by ramming together pretty much every single kaiju ever and making them throw down in a titanic battle to the death. And I mean, it's probably important to note that this movie features perhaps the most kaiju in any giant monster movie ever. We're talking Godzilla, Mothra, Rodan, King Ghidorah, Anguirus, Manila. It goes without saying, but they're pretty big players, and obviously anytime Godzilla, Mothra, and Rodan get together, you know that some pretty big stuff is gonna go down. Directed by Ishiro Honda, one of the biggest players in the Showa era of kaiju cinema, and one of Toho Studios' best and brightest assets. Destroy All Monsters takes place in a time of pure utopia, where world peace has been achieved by the year 1999, and all of the giant monsters that have previously tried to destroy the planet have instead been captured and confined to an area known as Monsterland. 
However, just when all seems well, all of these monsters are broken out of their metaphorical giant prison and instead mind controlled by an alien species known as the Kelax, who then send the kaiju to attack major cities across the planet. We're talking Godzilla tearing apart New York City, Rodan invading Moscow, and Mothra and her larval offspring laying waste to the cities of Beijing. Thankfully, Earth's defenses, spearheaded by the United Nations Science Committee in their first appearance, eventually wrestle back control of the poor mind control kaiju. But that's when the Kelax send their biggest and baddest nasty of all time, King Ghidorah himself, and then stuff really gets blown to smithereens. The thing is, although not quite campy enough to be mid 70s kaiju brilliance, and not quite gritty enough to be mid 80s and 90s kaiju raw action, Destroy All Monsters sits somewhere between the two, and yet, most importantly, it's just pure fun. Destroy All Monsters is insane, and it's a time where Toho Studios figured, what the heck, we've got all of these monsters, we may as well put them through their paces. Although not a highlight of kaiju history in any way, it sets the precedent for many more to come. Swinging in at number four, Giant Monsters All Out Attack, 2001. And if you're looking for a real mouthful, then why don't you try Godzilla, Mothra, and King Ghidorah, giant monsters all out attack. Yeah, because who cares about film titles anymore, right? Thankfully for us though, although colloquially dubbed GMK by Kaiju Monster Movie fans, 2001's Giant Monsters All Out Attack is perhaps one of the most accessible kaiju movies ever made. The thing is, whilst it certainly embraces the unabashed cheesiness that earlier Showa era and Heisei era kaiju movies were so famed for, this one was made during the short period known as the Millennium Era. And strangely enough, much like the zeitgeist captured in that period of cinema, GMK is surprisingly dark. For a kaiju movie, it's gritty as all hell, and although not perfect in any sense, there are moments in this movie that really turn the franchise on its head. And to address the kaiju elephant in the room, yes, Giant Monsters All Out Attack is hated by certain portions of the fan base, given the fact that King Ghidorah, the ultimate adversary of all time, is instead the good guy in this story. And that means only one thing, our beloved Godzilla is the villain. Written and directed by Shoshuke Kaneko, GMK features Godzilla as a ravenous returning force during a time where the world and the brave and noble JSDF are nervous about where and when Godzilla will strike again. Unbeknownst to them though, Godzilla is actually possessed by the souls of the dead that were lost during the events of World War II. And then the only thing left to do is for an unlikely alliance to be forged between Mothra, King Ghidorah and Baragon. Although the themes aren't always clear in this movie, and although they miss more often than they hit, GMK is one of the most complete giant monster movies of recent times. Although the unconventional Godzilla is kind of a hated theme, start to finish, GMK is entertaining. And that's the most important thing. Number three, Umbozu, translating to Sea Priest, is a yokai appearing in Japanese folklore. It's depicted as a large, shadowy figure looming out of the water appearing to sailors, breaking the ship as it rises, and demanding a bucket from whatever unlucky sailor happens to cross its path. Maybe it's got a leak in the roof. There's some differing opinions on what the origin of the Umubozu is, as there's no specific origin to its legacy or one tale we can point towards. But it's generally agreed that the origin is that they are the spirits of priests who were thrown into the ocean by villagers for one reason or another, and because these priests have had nowhere to lay their bodies to rest, their spirits inhabit the ocean and take the form of a dark specter, haunting and taking retribution on unfortunate souls in the waters. I'd never heard about this creature until researching it for this video, and I've got to say it has got some fantastic folklore. You really should do yourself a favor and look up Umabozu after. The Umabozu rising from the sea and asking if you've got a bucket for it is hilarious. Like it's more of an annoying roommate than a sea monster asking if it can borrow something. Folklore says the Umabozu would cling onto the hull of the ship and shriek at the sailors, sinking them down. The Umabozu's weakness? The smell of smoke, apparently. So if you're looking to get rid of one, light some sage up, I guess, or light something. I'm sure that's very easy to do when you're on a wooden boat in the water. Now, squaring up against the Megalodon. This one, I actually do feel like it could go either way. The Megalodon, Giant Shark, Umabozu, Scary Spectre. But I am going to give the edge to Umabozu solely because I don't know if it's got an actual tangible physical form or if it's just a shadow monster. You know, Megalodon can't really bite through shadows, I don't think. I don't think that's one of its powers. As well, I could really see Umabozu pulling that little trick, you know, hanging on to the side of the Meg, asking for a bucket, and then the Megalodon, who presumably doesn't speak any languages, not understanding what's happening, gets dragged down to the bottom of the sea, never to be seen again. 
Number 2. Skyla and Carabitus Skyla and Carabitus are sort of like a wrestling tag team duo as far as mythical sea monsters go. They worked in tandem, hounding opposite sides of a narrow strait of water, and famously clashed with the Argo Odysseus, made famous in Homer's Odyssey. The first beast, Skyla, was described to be a dragon-like creature, having 12 feet six long necks, and atop each neck was a head full of razor-sharp teeth. Sailors unlucky enough to pass through Skyla's territory were swooped from their vessel and swallowed whole before they'd even know what would happen. That doesn't sound so bad, you know, all in an instant. There's some speculation that perhaps the original Skyla was a very dramatized account of sailing through an underwater reef, which would definitely provide some explanation as to why a writhing mass of limbs and teeth would be shredding through a ship's hull. But Skyla is only one half of this dynamic duo, the Robin to Batman, and the other half is Carabitus. Carabitus is a little harder to describe, as it has no agreed appearance. In the original myth, The Odyssey, Carabitus presents itself as a whirlpool, savagely swirling around, creating the tides and pulling passing ships into their doom. Maybe it's just a little camera shy and it lets its more Handsome sibling, take a lot of the front-facing business. However, of the two, it could be argued that Carabitus was the more dangerous of the two, as during the Odyssey, Odysseus chose to sail his ship closer to Skyla than Carabitus, figuring that it was wiser to lose six men to lose the entire ship. Very wise guy. Now, the Megalodon. Drop out of this one before you even try. A one-on-one -on -one is one thing, but a duo battle against a whirlpool and a six-headed dragon? Save yourself the embarrassment and just clock out and go home. Number 1. Jormagander Jormagander is another old Nordic sea legend, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent, and is a serpent so large that its tail would surround the circumference of the earth and all its oceans and loop back around onto itself inside its mouth creating an Ouroboros. This impressive girth is where the creature gets its name, World Serpent. Jormagander's also had a bit of a star-studded run in pop culture, appearing in Marvel Comics and most recently the new God of War based around Nordic legends. Jormagander is fairly central to Nordic mythology, as it was said that when the creature would stop biting its own tail and release it from its jaws, it would be one of the signs of Ragnarok, and the creature would thrash its tail and the seas would rise up and flood Midgard, the Nordic term for their realm. There are several notable myths detailing Thor's many encounters with Jormagander, and his various attempts to overpower the beast and to slay the mighty serpent, although as the myths go, he was never quite successful. Good for me, because I actually don't think I would do too great in Ragnarok. I'm really not much of a fighter, and I don't think I would do well wrestling any Vikings. It's said that when Ragnarok occurs, Thor will slay the mighty serpent, only to find himself defeated by poison from the creature himself. All of this to say is that as far as sea monsters go, there could not possibly be anyone more powerful in lore than Jormagander. All this beast has to do to initiate the end of the world is to take its tail out of its mouth. The Megalodon wouldn't be able to challenge this thing. It would literally be over before it began. The Jormagander opens its mouth to start the duel, and that's it. It's done. Not only is the Megalon done, but everything's done. Seas flooding, fires raining down from the heavens. How could there possibly be a more powerful sea monster than this? Unless they update the Nordic myths at all, I doubt anything will ever tap the legend of the Jormagander. Coming in at number 5, we've got SCP-1548. Quick, name some enormous things. Elephants, office buildings, Mount Everest. Well, these are all good guesses. Yeah, they're, they're big, but here's the deal. Pretty much everything on this list is going to dwarf something you could conceivably behold on Earth. Yeah, it's gonna be one of those. 1548 is known as the Hateful Star. Stars, as you might already know, are huge. Like our sun is one of the smaller varieties going around. Try to wrap your head around that for a moment. In fact, this star is more than just a star, it's multiple solar phenomena. There's SCP-1548-1, which is a series of sunspots, each 40,000 by 15,000 kilometers in size. About 23 hours after they appear, they converge, becoming one enormous solar prominence, taking the shape of thaumaturgic symbols. Then there are 1548-2 and 3, which are sunspots and symbols that form under different circumstances, but are usually pretty huge too. These occurrences cause a whole lot of insane stuff to happen, from inflicting intense psychological damage on people who behold them, to strengthening materials, to causing weapons affected by the symbol to annihilate stuff around their areas of effect. In fact, a recent event has caused irreversible changes to our solar system. A rapid recurrence of 1548-1 events has led to a dense cloud of ionizing radiation to form around our solar system, totally changing the night sky. 
The foundation has started to disseminate information to keep the public calm, but the effects of this change in the sky have started to be noticed. Folks who witness certain things in the night sky have had their minds altered by the malice 1548 seems to emit, and powerful weapons have leveled large areas. There's something in there about a subset of folks known as Orthothans who seem to be waging some kind of war. The O5 Council has been voting on what to do for a while now, but I'm not exactly sure what's gonna happen next, so wish you the best of luck. Coming to number four, we've got SCP-3125. Now, if you want to read this one, you've got to know the code to get in. That's right, it's locked behind a keypad, and only those with a secret password are getting in. How do I know the password? Well, I'm special. You're not. But I'll give you a hint anyway. How many flavors in a standard roll of lifesavers? How many guys at the burger joint that fries their fries in peanut oil? What's seven minus two? What's the smallest dollar bill in Canada? A number that rhymes with alive. Use that as you will. I've got plausible deniability if you guys break into the number pad without being allowed to be there. Enter at your own risk. This SCP is quite a mind boink, described as an extremely large, highly aggressive, metastasized meme complex. It started outside our reality and now it's right up in it. I always knew the rising popularity of memes would be the death of us all. It's adapted for survival in much harder conditions than we can provide and therefore humans don't really have any sort of defense against 3125. When someone's affected by it, they become incapable of entertaining weaker ideas. Their whole being is then devoted to the propagation of 3125. So this thing can spread fast through the ideas of our weaker minds. And just like propaganda, you're not immune to it. Nope, not even you. No, you're not special. As of right now, it's not entirely present in our reality. If it ever managed to manifest completely, the knowledge of it would spread throughout the world very quickly, likely ending anybody's ability to do anything about it in less than 12 hours. Even now, folks who learn about it end up dead very quickly. The worst part is most folks who are infected and therefore are infectious don't really know it or they can't conceive of knowing it. Once 3125 makes its way into someone's mind, they forget about it and they don't even notice it. It uses some sort of brain altering thing to make sure that nobody's aware of it. The way the foundation describes it is like the stuff mosquitoes use to prevent you from noticing that they're sucking your blood. But instead of your blood, they're like taking over your brain and it's not itchy, it's just gonna kill you. Right now, there's no real way to fight it. A scientist suggested creating an irreality amplifier, but that would require the folks building it to understand what they were building, and then they would have to know about the meme, and then they'd get infected by it. So let's just hope that the foundation keeps it in check indefinitely, because if this gigantic mass of memetic information makes its way into our reality, we're toast. Next up on number three, Monsters 2010. Okay, here we have a pretty difficult one. On the one tentacle, monsters feature some of the most remarkable special effects that I've ever seen from a debut feature filmmaker. On the other tentacle, 2010's Monsters is difficult to access. This movie has a very peculiar pacing that makes it difficult to truly get behind, and on first viewing of this movie, I was left a little underwhelmed. However, when you watch this movie back, the craftsmanship behind it is astonishing. And for a film that promises on delivering a certain set of expectations, it certainly does that and then completely subverts them. Hey, maybe you'll be blown away by this movie like quite a number of people are and were, but all I'm saying is, if it doesn't stick, give it another chance. Also, the guy who made this movie, Gareth Edwards, well, I went to the same college as he did, and I grew up in the same town, so yeah, please don't think I'm being biased. And also, just saying, but Gareth Edwards is awesome, and both 2014's Godzilla and Star Wars Rogue One were remarkable efforts. Monsters tells a tale of a NASA deep space probe that after crash landing in the wilderness of Mexico, sprouts extraterrestrial life forms that rapidly spread throughout the Mexico-US border region, subsequently leading to the quarantine of the northern half of Mexico. Quickly, both the US and Mexican troops frantically battle to contain these creatures, and so a huge wall stretches the entirety of the border and is quickly assembled. Sound familiar? Yeah, this movie is geopolitical and it pulls no punches in that regard. It's also prophetic, maybe, which is pretty weird to say, but whatever. It stars Scoot McNary, who is awesome, by the way, as an American photojournalist, tasked with finding his boss's daughter, played by Whitney Abel, who is stranded in a Mexican hospital in the heartlands of the Ravage Zone. And that's all I'll say, really, because this movie is a road movie without any roads, just giant tentacular creatures roaming the wasteland. Also, it's important to note that this movie isn't exactly scary, but instead it offers a far more refreshing angle to the giant monster genre, and that alone is worth taking a look at. Coming in at number two, The Relic, 1997. Pretty unfortunate timing that, isn't it? This movie, like many others, makes SWAT teams look incredibly inefficient. Sorry SWAT, but it's a pretty glaring trope that I just had to point out. If you see a SWAT team, you know things are gonna get, well, 
pretty, pretty bad. Now, if you guys didn't know, I absolutely love this weird little 90s oddball of a movie, and so it only feels appropriate that somewhere down the line, we just have to give it a place on our giant monster movies list. Cathoga certainly stands the test of time in that regard, and although flawed in many ways, the amount of unabashed 90s brilliance that is poured into this movie is truly a feat to be witnessed. This movie is just fun, and if we're in the mood for being comparative, 1997's The Relic is the deep impact of the movie Monster World, and whilst we all know that deep impact is far superior to Armageddon, in that regard, The Relic is kind of unrivaled too. And not only is it unrivaled, it's just fun. This movie is so damn entertaining that you should give it a watch just for that sake. Directed by Peter Hymans and based upon the 1995 novel of the same name by Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child, The Relic tells a tale of Dr. Margot Green, played by the awesome Penelope Ann Miller, an evolutionary biologist who is stationed at the Field Museum of Natural History in downtown Chicago. Here, during her application for a brand new research grant, she stumbles upon the unearthed research of a missing anthropologist, Dr. John Whitney, who has seemingly disappeared after studying the cultural practices of a tribe in the jungles of South America. Now, part of this research is a strange stone statue that depicts a creature known only as the Cathoga, a mythical monster that rules the forgotten jungles of South America. And then, of course, suddenly and out of nowhere, people just start losing their heads and their brains willy-nilly in all manners of crazy, mysterious, museum-based monstrosities. If you enjoy ominous camera work around dark corridors, and if you enjoy the premise of loosely based anthropology in one of the most underrated and entertaining movies of the 90s with some remarkable performances to boot, giant monster included, then this movie is certainly for you. And finally, coming in at the morning spot, The Ritual, 2017. Alright then guys, let's pull no punches. If it's scary that you came for, then scary is what you're going to get. Truth be told, as has been highlighted in both parts of this series, when it comes to actual giant monsters in horror cinema, it's relatively difficult to efficiently deliver the spooks. It's like a sliding scale, really, and the larger these creatures become, then the more that the technicalities of horror cinema become diminished. It's difficult to balance, and perhaps the reason that many of these monster movies have instead relied on the tried and tested trope of creating the most convincingly large creature imaginable, 2017's The Ritual, however, is perhaps the finest balance of the two, and although we have already covered it in a creature feature regard, it is only proper that we give it its place here too. Mainly for the fact that, well, the Jotun is pretty damn large, and terrifying, and weird. But yeah, that's just what we've come to expect when it comes to the mythological monstrosities of the ancient Norse. That goes without saying. Directed by David Bruckner with a screenplay by Joe Barton, 2017's The Ritual is based upon the 2011 novel of the same name by Adam Neville, which is surprisingly brilliant. The film itself stars Rafe Spall, Arsha Ali, Robert James Collier, and Sam Troughton, who all offer some freaking fantastic performances in this movie, and play Luke, Phil, Hutch and Dom respectively, four best friends who agree to hike the Kungsleden Forest in Sarek National Park, Northern Sweden, following the tragic death of their longtime friend, Rob, who wished to hike the trail before he was murdered in an effort to bring their struggling friendship back together. Spoilers, kind of. And really, that's kind of all there is to the ritual without giving any other spoilers away, because it's four best friends trapped in a terrifying forest as a giant monster and its fanatical death cult roam the woodland ready to ruin everyone's day. And yet, although the brilliance of this movie relies on some well-constructed interlocking narratives, ultimately resulting in a more than cathartic ending, the best part of 2017's The Ritual is the creature design alone. Seriously, the less we say about the Jotun, the better, but this film features one of the most unique monster designs of recent times, and whilst not as big as Godzilla or King Kong, as so far as originality in horror cinema goes, this giant, terrifying demigod is certainly worth the zealotry. Give it a watch. Coming in at number five, we've got Slattern. Pacific Rim is just such a wicked kaiju movie, eh? I mean, technically, I don't know many people who would classify it as horror, but the smattering of enormous entities is enough to get any monster fan excited. Throughout the flick, it manages to one-up each monster with a bigger, badder beastie. Even the first one could be the main event in a lesser movie, but Guillermo del Toro does not let up. After fighting their way through all the categories of kaiju, the folks from the Jaeger Foundation have one final challenge, the first ever Category 5. Slattern. This thing is wicked. Over 180 meters tall and weighing in at nearly 7,000 tons, it is a force to be reckoned with. It blows all the other kaiju out of the water, which is kind of funny when you think about it because of that nuclear payload that gets detonated moments after it shows up. You know, because all the, the water is blown away for a moment. Okay, focus. Slattern isn't just huge, it's dangerous. It has three insane tails that can pierce armor and whip around at mock speed. It has a freaky hammerhead that can be used to slam people to smithereens and it's so toxic and nuclear that its insides are glowing blue. Wow. And the crowning jewel of all sorts of kaiju fits in well here too. It's pretty much immune to any and all attacks. Like, 
Humanity had to develop Jaegers in order to even have a chance against these beasts, and as the first Category 5 to make it through the breach, Slattern is extremely resilient. It takes a long fight, a nuclear explosion, and a nuclear turbine blast point blank to the chest to take it down. That is one heck of a movie monster. Coming in at number four, we've got sandworms. We've talked about graboids and ass blasters a few times in this channel, but I can't recall any time where I discussed Dune. That ends today with an acknowledgement of one of the most iconic monsters of all time. Oh man, this might not be horror proper either. It's more sci-fi, but oh well. Sandworms are absolutely bonkers. An average specimen can grow to be over 450 meters long, which is half a kilometer. And those are just the observed ones. It's thought that some worms that live in the Southern Pole area can grow up to 1,000 meters, although it's never been confirmed. Still, the fact that worms of that size is even possible is nuts, and that is just the length. Sure, it's crazy that they're that long, but their maws are incomprehensibly large too. Some of the gaping mouth holes can be 120 or even 240 meters across. They could swallow entire buildings, no chewing required. Just absolutely enormous, these ones. They're so big, people on the planet Arrakis use them as their distance measuring units. How long will it take to get there? Oh, about five sandworms. The way their bodies work is pretty nuts too. See, their insides resemble something like a furnace and generate heat and flames. Imagine being a living being who heats up to the point of producing fire. Life is pain, I suppose. Although their tough skin and scales are up to the challenge. These outer pieces of armor are so tough, they're basically impenetrable, although, if you know what you're doing, the scales can be used to ride the worms, which is pretty cool. Next up at number three, Cloverfield, 2008. You know what guys? I've said it before and I will say it again, Cloverfield doesn't get the credit that it deserves. And as far as giant monster movies go that actually do justice to the science fiction horror genre as a whole, then Cloverfield is perhaps one of the closest and most recent depictions of just exactly that. Cloverfield is awesome, and also as a side note, if the whisperings are to be believed, we'll be getting a hopefully worthy sequel to this movie sooner rather than later, which is reason enough to be excited really. The thing is, we spoke in the intro about kaiju movies and how they are the quintessential essential example of giant monster movies, but as we also mentioned, they also aren't exactly scary. Cloverfield, in my opinion, is the remedy to that, and in turn, it was inspired by the reverence that the author J.J. Abrams has as a filmmaker for Godzilla and all of his friends. His intention was to give life to the western version of the kaiju genre, and he did exactly that, whilst also staying true to the promise of horror. For those of you that haven't yet seen it or brushed it off as another Hollywood cash grab, please Give it a chance, it's awesome. Written by Drew Goddard, the man behind the brilliant Netflix Daredevil series, and directed by Matt Reeves, the man behind the Planet of the Apes series, Cloverfield, of course, was put together by J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot Studios with the intention of breathing life to giant monster movies for a Western audience. Shot from a found footage perspective, it tells a tale of a man named Rob Hawkins and his then girlfriend Beth, who, whilst during a party in downtown New York City, find themselves in the midst of a giant monster attack in which the city itself is torn asunder by a terrifying unknown alien life form. You see, the original Godzilla movies have analytically been related to the devastating World War II atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a metaphorical cultural expression of the tragedy that unfolded. Subsequently, in many ways, Cloverfield has been tied to New York City's own tragic destructive event with the 9-11 attacks. For that reason, and that reason alone, I think Cloverfield deserves its place as a cultural titan of sci-fi and horror. It truly does. Coming in at number two, The Host, 2006. Alright guys, this is where things get difficult, because in many ways, 2006 The Host is perhaps one of the finest monster movies ever made. Period. This movie truly is remarkable, and whilst we've covered it on several occasions in our Korean horror movies list, in relation to monster movies, we really can't let it slip on by like an amphibious radioactive sea creature slipping beneath a sewer. The thing is though, where it becomes difficult, is that like several movies on this list, the host is a genre mashup of sorts. This is a movie about family and loss and grief, and also a bizarre mixture of action and black comedy that is actually hilarious in parts, in places they really shouldn't be. I mean, it's a result of South Korean filmmaking as a whole being incredibly transcendent with genre, playing with themes and tropes that Western directors wouldn't otherwise do, and yet truth be told, the results are startling. It makes for a movie the likes of which can't be replicated, and that alone is reason enough to see it. 
Also, please don't get this movie confused with the 2013 movie, The Host, because, eh, yeah, no thank you. Written and directed by Bong Joon-ho, the awesome South Korean director and man behind Snowpiercer, which you should also take a look at if you haven't, The Host tells the tale of Park Gang-do, a slow-witted guy who runs a snack bar on the banks of the Hum River, who witnesses his daughter, hyun So get kidnapped by a gigantic, grossly mutated amphibious creature that was created by a secretive chemical spill and subsequent cover-up by US authorities, which then subsequently sends the city of Seoul into complete and utter Mayhem, as you may imagine, really. Obviously, spoilers are a ban from here on in, so we'll leave it at that. But really, the host does something incredibly impressive with the giant monster genre. It's terrifying, it's hilarious in places, and most importantly, this giant monster movie actually has heart. Maybe even like three hearts, actually. Probably. And finally, coming in at number one spot, Troll Hunter 2010. <laughs> Alright guys, you wanted giant monster movies, you got it. Now I've certainly ummed and ahed about it and after lengthy deliberation I'm fairly certain that this movie delivers everything we've ever wanted when it comes to being awestruck by a species of creature that domineers our very human sized landscape. Troll Hunter is exactly that, it's smart, it's well executed and most importantly this film is gigantic in scale. The thing is I think quite a lot of people brush this movie off as too ridiculous to ever have been worthwhile and whilst you may be thinking that the notion of trolls are an overbaked concept in folklore, never mind in horror cinema, the best part of this film is that most importantly, it believes in itself. At not a single point in this movie did I ever stop and think that visual authenticity was important to this film, because it's not. Hey, in some instances the visuals behind this movie aren't exactly great, but you know what supersedes that? The suspension of disbelief. I believe in this movie because from start to finish, much like with Cloverfield, what we are witnessing is the documentation of events from a human perspective. You see, it may seem obvious, but the giants in the movie are far more giant if you see them through the eyes of the terrified creature trying to survive on the ground. Hint, that's us humans. I don't know guys, I could ramble on about this movie for days, but as far as giant monster movies go, Troll Hunter is one of the finest examples ever made. Written and directed by Andre Ovredad, the man responsible for the autopsy of Jane Doe, which is also awesome, Troll Hunter tells the tale of a group of students from Volda University College who set out to make a documentary about a suspected bear poacher out in the Norwegian wilderness. Well, they soon find the bear poacher, but as they also soon find out, it's certainly not bears that he's after, but a far bigger and far more terrifying kind of creature. Honestly guys, Troll Hunter is awesome. It really, really, really is. If you haven't yet seen it, please give it a watch. You won't be disappointed. Number five, The Kraken. Over the port side, boy, star she blows. Butter down the hatches, the Kraken's there. I'm sorry, I absolutely could not resist. I'm just trying to paint you a picture of the scene here. The Kraken is an absolutely legendary sea monster, harking back to old sailors' tales from the 17th century. It started as an old Nordic legend and was said to haunt the waters from Norway through Iceland. But as its legend grew, stories of the Kraken would be passed throughout the world, carrying on from sea to shining sea. It's widely theorized that the legend of the Kraken began with sightings of the colossal squid, a creature almost as mythical as the Kraken itself. An old fisherman's tale, it's depicted as a colossal cephalopod capable of crushing a fully stacked galleon with its tentacles and bringing it down to the ocean floor. If the tentacles and its heaving beak aren't enough, it also creates whirlpools around it, as it drags your doomed ship down with it all the way down to Davy Jones's locker. The Kraken probably has one of the best PR agents in the sea monster community, being the subject of stories, songs for centuries, finding its way into numerous movies, a career making role in Clash of the Titans, a very strong supporting role in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise really helped elevate it to stardom, even finding its way into a bunch of video games over the years, serving as a boss for players in God of War, Sea of Thieves, and for the real OGs out there, RuneScape as well. When it comes down to who could defeat who, it's not even a question. The Megalodon wouldn't get so much as 30 seconds with the Kraken. The Kraken of lore was crushing ships in seconds. You think it's even gonna notice crushing a shark? Number four, the Loch Ness Monster. Now, the Loch Ness Monster is probably the most famous sea creature of all time, and probably one of the most famous Scottish things of all time, alongside William Wallace, Kilts, and Haggis. It's also one of the world's oldest recurring cryptid stories, with the first reports of Nessie going all the way back to the year 565. And since then, Nessie has delighted cryptozoologists the world over, becoming a cultural icon for Scotland and the Loch Ness as a whole. 
There's been several, several concentrated efforts to really find the Loch Ness Monster over the years. And while nothing has ever officially shown up on a sonar or a radar, that has never stopped the stream of sightings and photos of the Loch's gentle giant. Nessie seems pretty benevolent. There's never been a story or an allegation of the Loch Ness Monster eating or hurting anyone, usually just sticking its cute little head out of the water for a quick little blurry candid to be discussed and analyzed for years. Let's talk serious for a second here. In the ring, squaring up in a 1v1, I've absolutely got Nessie over the Megalodon, easy. That long neck is going to wrap around the Meg, get that thing lassoed. You know, the Meg is big, sure. But the Loch Ness Monster clearly has some stealth capabilities. I mean, it's been eluding capture for the better part of 1,500 years, so I've got to imagine that Nessie's got to know some pretty good tricks for hiding. But more so than anything, Nessie's got the people of Scotland riding for them. You're not just messing with a sea creature Megalodon, you're messing with a beloved cultural icon. It would be like going to war against raccoons in Toronto. The people just won't stand for it. Next up at number three, King Kong vs. Godzilla, 1962. I'll be damned if this isn't one of the finest moments in kaiju cinema of all time, really. To be a fan of this type of cinema, you have to adhere to a certain set of disbelief. When there's a guy in a lizard suit rolling around a fake background, yeah, sometimes it doesn't always work. And whilst that is certainly the case in 1962 King Kong vs Godzilla, Holy moly, if there aren't some absolutely astounding moments of cinema to be found here. It's crazy because what's so great about this genre is that Toho Studios just didn't care. Not in the sense that they didn't put their heart and soul into these movies because that's exactly what they did. They just didn't do things by a certain playbook. Hollywood be damned as far as they were concerned because they wanted to put one guy in a lizard suit and one guy in a gorilla outfit and then make the best damn movie that they could. This is the culmination of that very spirit, King Kong vs Godzilla and whilst next year there is a remake coming our way, if you've got a spare 90 minutes, just give this movie a watch. Really, this is one of the finest examples of kaiju cinema going and it's certainly worth your attention. Again, directed by Shiro Honda and written by Shinichi Sekizawa, the story behind King Kong vs Godzilla originally began with the giant Lord of the Apes actually throwing down with some version of a giant Frankenstein monster, which, let's not beat about the bush, would have been absolutely awesome, but thankfully for us, Toho snapped out of it and realised that the giant lizard king would be a far greater adversary. Obviously, the narrative behind this movie is pretty self-explanatory, but the cultural impact that this movie has had on science fiction cinema is kind of staggering. There are so many urban myths and legends about this movie that it's worth experiencing that just for the fact, and whilst most of them aren't exactly true, the ending to King Kong vs Godzilla is one of the most epic conclusions of 20th century cinema. This movie is brilliant, and its historical significance should not be forgotten. Coming in at number two, Gamera, Guardian of the Universe, 1995. Finally, finally we have a place to put this movie, and yeah, whatever, this movie isn't scary in the slightest, but my word, if this movie isn't all kinds of marvellous, then I don't know what is. The thing is, we get it. We love Godzilla, we love King Kong, they're the greatest, but until this movie, Gamera was one of the most overlooked kaiju monsters of all time. Put it this way, Guardian of the Universe was both a reboot of the franchise and also the ninth movie featuring the turtle shelled monster hero. Gamera is persistent and the payoff, surprisingly, was one of the greatest kaiju movies of all time. Gamera is a kaiju like no other. He's a massive massive, fire-breathing, prehistoric turtle, and much like his Godzilla brethren, he was mutated via exposure to nuclear weapons. At the start of the Kaiju franchise, Gamera was an all-consuming, aggressive force, but slowly, as the franchise evolved, Gamera took a backseat to his other more famous Koju co-stars, and eventually was forced into a niche, to say the least. You see, eventually Gamera took on a less malevolent force, and instead, he became a defender of humanity, particularly human children, and a guardian of our planet against extraterrestrial alien forces. All of this finally culminated in his reinvention of a reinvention in 1995's Gamera Guardian of the Universe, and this movie is astounding because of it. Written by Kazunori Ito and directed by Shusuke Kaneko, again, Gamera Guardian of the Universe embodies that same spirit that Toho Studios have perfected over the decades. This movie is just freaking fun. 
It's so fantastically bizarre that you can't help but be entertained. Gyo's flying through the skies, attacking people left, right, and center, and the giant fire breathing turtle, who is a friend to all human children, saving the day. In many ways, this entry embodies everything that we love about kaiju cinema. And as a side note, the following Gamera centric movies are also worth a watch. Again, if you're looking for some 90 minutes of entertainment, you really cannot go wrong with Gamera. And finally, coming in at number one spot, Gajira, 1954. It just has to be, doesn't it? And whilst over here at Top 5 Scary Videos, we do indeed favour doing things a little differently when it comes to picking out particular movie entries. We don't need that here. You see, kaiju monster movies already speak for themselves in that regard, or well, raw for themselves, I guess. And 1954's Gojira, the most important giant monster movie that has ever emerged from Japan, exemplifies that fact entirely. This is the definitive Godzilla movie, and still to this day, over 60 years later, 1954's Gojira is unrivaled. It is astounding how well this movie is held up. And much like some of the suit work seen in King Kong vs Godzilla, some of the scenes that were captured in this movie were hallmark moments in science fiction cinema. Following its release, Ashiro Honda, the man behind 1954's Gojira and one of Toho Studios' most legendary kaiju contributions, said, if Godzilla had been a dinosaur or some other animal, he would have been killed with just one cannonball. But if he were equal to an atomic bomb, we would wouldn't know what to do. So I took the characteristics of an atomic bomb and then applied them to Godzilla. You see, this is exactly why kaiju monster movies capture something so special. They exemplified an era, a period of Japanese history that was still trying to recover from the horrors of the Second World War. In fact, the destruction seen throughout this black and white B-movie, metaphorically speaking, still can rival some of the most expensive and well-produced giant monster movies ever made. 1954's Gojira is a masterclass in how to make a giant monster truly terrifying. Low angles, ample pacing on the reveal, high angled shots of the ant-like human survivors fleeing in terror, Gojira is sci-fi horror 101. Whilst this genre isn't exactly for everyone, the influence it has had on the horror genre is undeniable. This movie cemented Godzilla as the definitive, unrivaled giant monster, and since its release way back when in 1954, few films have come close to toppling it. Kicking off at number 5, Them, 1954. Mountain lions never come down into the desert. No, no cat ever lived leave a print like that. Maybe something was said down there. Alright guys, a lot of you folks called for some classic black and white style monster movies, and yet I held off including the more iconic of them, given the fact that, yeah, no matter how much you'd like to argue against it, they're still pretty damn dated. However, one of those movies may well be impervious to the sands of time, and of course it would feature an equally impervious creature as its titular monstrosity. Them, a movie about giant radioactive ants released way back when in 1954. And yet, despite its initial premise promising some unabashed cheese of the 50s variety, surprisingly, this movie holds up phenomenally well. Particularly in its opening scene, which from a horror perspective was actually way ahead of its time. The sad truth is, though, from our high and mighty tower of 2019, when we look back at black and white cinema, they have to work extra hard for them to stand the test of time. Granted, movies like Psycho, 1933's King Kong, and the original Godzilla are iconic in their own right, but still, the truth remains the same. To be good, you gotta be the best. Directed by Gordon Douglas with a story from George Worthing Yates, them tells a tale of two New Mexico police officers, Sergeant Ben Peterson, played by James Whitmore, who in his later life would go on to play Brooks from the Shawshank Redemption, alongside trooper Ed Blackburn, as they discover a young girl distraught, wandering the desert in a strange, almost catatonic state. They take her to a nearby trailer set up by her family who were vacationing there, only to find that he's been mysteriously and savagely attacked by a strange, almost impossibly large creature. While what ensues is a classic cat and mouse pursuit of two intrigued police officers following in the wake of this destruction, and whilst anything else would be spoilers, when this movie gets going, it actually really, really gets going, because, well, giant radioactive ants. That's why. That's all I'm saying. Despite that, though, for a movie that during its time would have relied on being a quick cash grab, instead, them actually takes its time in portraying an incredibly compelling narrative. For storyline and performance alone, this movie is worth a watch, and yes, whilst the effects may be dated, the bones of this movie are giant monster cinema 101. Swinging in at number four, Prophecy, 1979. And if you thought Annihilation was cool for featuring some mutated ursine, think again, because 1979's Prophecy was doing it 
before it was even cool. And that's the point of this movie actually because still 1979's prophecy gets so trashed by critics that it's hard to see the mutated leaves for the trees. You see as a creature feature prophecy is like playing a feral druid in an RPG. There's more metamorphoses than you can shake a branch at but as a giant monster movie this movie relies on a hodgepodge of all of those creatures into one giant pile of vile mutagenic flesh. Sounds gross? Well yeah that's because it is and prophecy loses quite a bit of its sheen down to the fact that the practical effects aren't exactly the greatest in this movie especially when you understand the choices that this movie made in watering them down but still there's something quite charming about prophecy that makes it worth its salt and most importantly like all worthy monster movies this one has a message. Written by David Seltzer and directed by John Frankenheimer, the brilliant yet troubled director responsible for 1962's Birdman of Alcatraz amongst many others, Prophecy was the first flagship title of the so called Hollywood North, a business move in the late 70s intended to give a facelift for cinema in Canada. And what better way to do that than to create a story about a giant vengeful forest spirit hell bent on destroying a paper mill in the woodland of North America. I mean yeah it is set in Maine but still you get the picture. It tells the tale of Dr Robert Verne, an environmental scientist who was commissioned to undertake a report about three lumberjacks that had mysteriously disappeared. Obviously his pregnant wife accompanies him because of course that's a sensible thing to do and suddenly Dr Vern witnesses something incredibly wrong with this forest. Giant salmon, vicious raccoons, tadpoles the size of bullfrogs because why not? This movie essentially takes the ending scene of Jumanji and injects it with some highly mutagenic substances and then just lets everything go to hell. Don't piss off mother nature guys, that's all I'm saying. No, but seriously, save the planet. Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically, a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay per view, I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called the Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928. He's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah. Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg for sure. And also, the mind control, I don't know how sharks brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there, yeah you're in trouble sharky. Number 2, The Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred text now, the bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster, who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire, it emits smoke from its nostrils, and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature, told by two different peoples? <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon I think would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the twilight zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. 
Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate. Yeah, and it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Kicking off at number five. Dark was the night, 2014. Probably just some punk kids playing a prank, huh? Yeah, why would they come out this far? Never seen nothing like it. All the animals just ban. All right, guys, let's be honest. It's pretty difficult to be completely terrified by any sort of monster movie given enough scale. Because the bigger they are, the easier they are to completely phase out any kind of tangible fear. Take note on that because in this list, we'll be scaling our expectations down a little bit, but it may also leave you scratching your head and asking the question what's the difference between a giant monster movie and a creature feature? I don't get it, Jack. And the answer is not a lot, really. And also, I don't really get it either, but primarily it relies on a trope that coincidentally movies like Godzilla pioneered, and that is the fear of the unknown. But not in the cosmic horror sense, but in not knowing exactly what we're dealing with until it's too late. Let me introduce you to this movie, Dark Was the Night, a straight to DVD B movie that surprisingly is absolutely brilliant. And more importantly, it's pretty bloody scary, and it packs one of the most well written endings to any kind of monster based horror, I think. And you know what? It also stars Kevin Durand in the leading role, the guy who plays Kimi in Lost, Harbard in Vikings, and loads of other mid-caliber roles through movies and television. And in this instance, it's an absolute pleasure to see him take the lead, because he certainly can carry a movie if given the chance. Written by Tyler Heisel and directed by Jack Keller, Dark Was the Night tells the tale of the small isolated town of Maiden Woods, where Sheriff Paul Shields, played by Durand, is investigating a series of bizarre disappearances alongside his new deputy, Donnie Saunders, played by Lucas. Haas, who is also pretty damn good in this film. Obviously, as you may imagine, the disappearances have something to do with an ancient evil that lingers in the woods. And that's all I'll say, because the writing behind this movie is pretty remarkable. And for a B-movie, it's even more impressive. The creature design is fantastic, the pacing is spot on, and the finale to this movie will leave you pretty astounded in some way or another. More importantly, it's just downright entertaining. And whilst these monsters aren't exactly King Kong, they're full to the teeth with horror. Swinging so in at number four, The Monster, 2016. I know what you think, okay? I know what you think. What is it? What? And again, another movie that came out in the past decade that seemingly flew beneath the radar and still is pretty damn brilliant. The thing is though, whilst this movie certainly does exactly what it says on the tin, as in, well, the name of this movie is pretty damn clear, it's also important to note that this movie certainly isn't for everyone. If I said to you that it's an A24 movie, then that may clear things up a little, but also if you're in the mood for a subversion of the genre that also deals with some pretty damn terrifying psychological implications regardless, then yeah this is certainly the movie for you. Also, giant man-eating monsters abound, and all that jazz. Written and directed by Brian Bettino, the man responsible for 2008's The Strangers. If I had to draw a genre comparison for this movie, I'd say that 2016's The Monster is to monster movies, as 2012's The Battery is to zombie movies. Yeah, it takes a little bit more to enjoy than the typical sit back and witness the destruction, but that does not mean it's not worthwhile. 
It tells the tale of Kathy, played by Zoe Kazan, who is pretty remarkable here, and her 10 year old daughter Lizzie, played by Ella Ballantyne, who are driving to her father's house as it's his turn to share Lizzie's custody. The thing is, from the off, we're overloaded with some pretty stark information. Lizzie, a 10 year old girl, is sick and tired of taking care of her abusive, alcoholic mother Kathy, and she makes it pretty damn clear that she intends to live with her father permanently. While as the trip stretches on and darkness descends, the pair hit a wolf in their car, killing it. However, on closer inspection, it seems that the wolf was already on its last legs as it had been attacked by something far bigger and far more ferocious. And yeah, as you may imagine, the rest is spoilers. But really, 2016's The Monster is such a refreshing departure from the norm that it's a must see in my books. But it also paints itself with the same vivid tropes of the monster genre as we catch glimpses of a far more terrifying creature in the periphery. Coming in at three, Titans. Hailing from Greek mythology, the Titans were the pre Olympian gods. According to the Theogony of Hesiod, they were the 12 children of the primordial parents Uranus and his mother Gaia, with six male Titans Oceanus, Coas, Creus, Hyperion, Lapetus, and Cronus, and six female Titans called the Titanites. Cronus mated with his sister Rhea, and together they became the first generation of Olympians. Zeus and his five siblings, Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, and Poseidon. Descendants of the Titans are also called Titans. The Titans were also former gods, the generation of gods preceding the Olympians. They were ultimately overthrown as part of the Greek succession myth, which told how Cronus seized power from his father Uranus and ruled the cosmos with the Titans as his subordinates. Now, Cronus and the Titans were in turn defeated and replaced as the ruling pantheon of gods by Zeus and the Olympians in a tenure referred to as the Titanomachy. As a result, of the war, Cronus and the vanquished Titans were banished from the upper world, being held imprisoned under guard in Tartarus. Although, according to history, some of these Titans were allowed to remain free. Coming in at two, Fatchin. Hailing from Scottish folklore, the Fatchan or Fatchin is a monster or giant described by John Francis Campbell in popular tales of the West Highlands as having a single eye in the middle of its face, a single hand protruding from its chest instead of arms, and a single leg emerging from its central axis. Not only that, but it has a single tuft of hair on the top of its head, which Campbell says, I quote, It were easier to take a mountain from the root than to bend that tuft. Quite the tuft indeed. However, Campbell isn't the only writer to reference the giant. Douglas Hyde did so too in his collection of Irish folklore called Beside the Fires. I quote, He held a very thick iron flay club in a skinny hand and 20 chains out of it, and 50 apples on each chain of them, and a great venomous spell on each great apple of them and a girdle of the skins of deer and roebuck around the thing that was his body, and one eye in the forehead of his black face countenance, and one bare, hard, very hairy hand coming out of his chest, and one veiny, thick soled leg supporting him, and a close, firm, dark blue mantle of twisted, hard, thick feathers protecting his body. And surely he was more like unto devil than to man. Now, though hailing from different countries, both descriptions seem to represent branches of a common Gaelic tradition. Finally, coming in at number one. Cacus, hailing from Roman mythology, Cacus, meaning bad, was a fire breathing giant and the son of Vulcan. He was ultimately killed by Hercules after terrorizing the Aventine Hill before the founding of Rome. However, let's go back. Cacus lived in a cave in Italy on the future site of Rome. To survive, he feasted on the flesh of humans and would nail the heads of victims to the doors of his cave. Now, like I said, he would later be defeated by Hercules. And according to Evander, Hercules stopped to pasture the cattle he had stolen. Stolen from Gerion near Cacus's lair. As Hercules slept, the giant took a liking to the cattle and stole eight of them, four bulls and four cows, dragging them by their tails so as to leave a trail in the wrong direction. When Hercules awoke, the remaining cattle made suggestive noises towards the cave. So Hercules, now angry, stormed towards the cave and a terrified Cacus blocked the entrance with a vast, immovable boulder. So Hercules quite literally tore off the top of the mountain to reach him. Cacus responded with spewing fire and smoke while Hercules attacked with tree branches and rocks the size of millstones. Hercules eventually leapt into the cave, aiming for the area where the smoke was heaviest and grabbed Cacus, strangling the monster to death. According to Virgil in Book 8 of the Ionide, Hercules grasped Cacus so tightly that his eyes popped out and there was no blood left in his throat. Yikes. 